Thank you for joining us for another show where we focus on leadership and development in Africa. Tonight we host Professor Michele Mugo. She shares her insights with us. We get your views on the issues and we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuro. Joining us on the show tonight is an incredible woman, Professor Michele Mugo. She's a playwright, an author, an activist, an instructor, and a poet. She's also a literary critic and a professor of literature in the Department of African American Studies at Syracuse University. Professor Mugo teaches orature, literature, and creative writing. Her publications include six books, a play co-authored with Ngogi Wathiongo, and three monographs. She has also edited journals and has worked on the Zimbabwean school curriculum. The East African Standard listed her as among 100 most influential people in Kenya in 2002. Let's get her insights into Africa. So much, it's such a pleasure to have you on the Africa Leadership Dialogues. You've come back and, and been in Kenya for a couple of weeks now, touring and speaking to people, engaging in debates and interviews. I'd like your sense of where the continent is right now. How, how are you feeling about Africa? Hopeful or concerned? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. But, and let me first of all acknowledge uh, Riera University, where I have been as a distinguished visiting professor and where I'm also a member of the University Council because they've made this uh, contact with um, Kenyans and, and um, all uh, kinds of populations that I have been able to speak with possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I keep telling everybody I'm here uh, rendering my national service at old age and I'm happy to do so. Riera is not paying me, but yeah. Oh, th th so thank you for that. And, and they say retired, but not tired. Oh, yeah, That's yeah, what they say. You know, <laughs> right. I'm feeling so spiritually rejuvenated oh. and also intellectually, even though bodily I'm, I'm tired. But Africa, you know, um, it's very, very important to acknowledge what we have achieved since independence. And um, because this is a short uh, program, I, I cannot go into all the details. We all know where we have achieved. If you were to look at a place um, like Kenya and going back to even uh, the 1990s, and the 1980s, freedom of expression and speech was unheard of. It really, really was scary to um, name the wrongs or suggest um, uh, anything that was seen as criticism. Now it's possible. Women have fought a huge battle uh, going back to Beijing and, and all the um, victories that they won through that conference. So it's there on paper. but. Um, uh, having given those uh, two examples, and, and I could give many more, including universities that have opened up, whereas, you know, at Independence, there was only Makerere, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi. And um, so a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it also makes me very sad to say that a whole lot of mistakes that we started making at independence and before them, then we have continued to do. For one, uh, not being self-sufficient um, and, and hanging on to the apron strings of our former colonizers. A lot of the times in terms of values, ideas, so on and so forth, but also in terms of economies, the inequity in economic and um, wealth distribution among our people, it is terrible in Africa. Some people are extremely rich. They don't know what to do with, with their wealth. Others have nothing to um, eat. Um, issues of women having fought so hard to be where they are, 
some of the statistics that we are getting on issues such as rape, including you know, that of girls, and including you know, molestation at home in the families and so forth. Um, but I'm, I'm energized, and I've always had hope for Africa. It's, it's great to hear that you're energized and, and you've touched on a few issues that we're going to come back to. Just important to mention for many of the young generation, they don't even remember the 90s. Mm -hmm. And so often you see in the media people lamenting that the media freedom, it's worse than ever before. How did we end up here? You need to read the history books to know <laughs> we've come a long way and must continue to fight and move forward and, and ensure we are pushing um, uh, for our freedoms. Um, but, but let's come to the mistake. Before that, yes. colonialism, yes. I heard Dr. Gachukia trying to explain to these young people that at one time uh, the racism in Kenya under settler colonialism was such that there were spaces for Europeans only, Asians only, Arabs and mixed people, then Africans at the bottom. And they looked at her and she said at, at major places like the Norfolk Hotel, you could find a sign saying no Africans and dogs. They didn't believe her. They really thought, but go ahead. No, thank you. A very important point. And, and, and the education system and making sure our children know where we've come from perhaps mm -hmm. is something we must discuss. Mm -hmm. Before we come to that, you've talked about consistently making the same mistakes, which is such a tragedy. Yes. But if you were to look at the African presidents that we have had, over the past, from, from the independence generation. Mm -hmm. Are there any presidents who did get it right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me, in fact, push a little uh, further back and, and look at the time of liberation and some of the areas in the liberated zones in the kind of work that Amilcar Cabral was doing in Guinea-Bissau, the kind of work that Samora Machel was doing before independence, addressing issues of women, equality, equity, and giving them positions of leadership in the party. Um, I have to, um, you know, um, uh, remind us of, you know, these people who went before us and demonstrated that it was possible to lead and be, um, you know, people who understood the problems of marginalized groups like women and youth and so forth. But your question, we have a lot of, a number of African presidents that we really should celebrate and feel proud of. Um, I, I've always liked Mwalim Julius Nyerere because of his imagination, because of his innovation, because of his bold boldness to address the economic system in Tanzania, okay? Ujama may not have succeeded, but this was one area in which there was an attempt to make sure that ordinary people and those who are poor were taken care of, you know, in um, an experiment that, as I say, did not quite work the way it was supposed uh, to do. I, I, Samora Machel, um, you know, somebody um, I, I, and, and, and his lovely uh, former wife, who is uh, now Mrs. Mandela, Grasa Machel, I knew them personally. And, and the work that um, they did in the short time that um, Mozambique was independent, even as bandits were actually being funded from some places in Europe, including America, to destabilize, you know, Mozambique. Um, of course, uh, uh, President Nelson Mandela. I mean, this is an icon who has really shown to the world what it is to be a leader. Yeah, so we have, I could name a few others. Later on, I could name one of the youngest presidents we had in Africa that I had a lot of respect for, President Sankara. Mm -hmm. President San Sankara, in that little poor country, you know, um, we literally went out of his way to show with his ministers that they would be working along with the people. They um, decided against exorbitant, um, expensive uh, living. They would be driving in, um, you know, Porsches and, um, you know, cut down the expenditure of the state to such a point that they were promoting areas that brought the rest of the world, you know, to come and see what was happening, especially in the area of film and culture. Yeah, so we, we, we have people to be proud of. Th thank you for that. And, you know, I, I, the more we do this show, the more Julius Nyerere's name comes up. And I start thinking this was an African icon who is unsung. We yes. should be talking more and learning more Absolutely. about our African icons like Nyerere. If you were in a room with African presidents today 
and you had a chance, Professor, to deliver a message to them, what would you say? Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention um, President Nkrumah, and I won't go into it, but and I, we forget that part of why he was overthrown was his vision of Pan-Africanism that some people felt you know, was so large that it ignored uh, Ghana. What would I say to um, our presidents today? I would um, really um, say that it is very, very important to demonstrate that you can rule without exerting power that intimidates and frightens people. I would say, let us talk about closeness to our people, not just during election times, but really, you know, making ourselves available, the presidents making themselves available to them. I would say we really need to take seriously issues of marginalized groups, because if people feel alienated and rejected, there is no way they will want to participate in national development. And the economy is one area that I have to keep harping on to that. There is no reason why Africa with such resources should have the kind of poverty that we are having and allowing our natural resources to be extracted and go you know, out somewhere else to enrich other people. Um, allowing war, like you talk about the diamond war, you know, be waged on our continent because people are taking our precious stones away. I would say to our presidents, come on, you know, let us show the kind of innovation that, you know, will um, uh, situate Africa in such a dignified space that no one can come and fool around with it, even if we are poor. Dignity is very, very important, and self-pride, rather than always looking out there. And I said this to our president the other day when I met with him. You know, I said, please, Mr. President, you and President Obama should teach other presidents to laugh more. It's important because it comes from the soul, and it shows, you know, you have a heart and a soul, and, and you know, that, that happiness is very, very important. It's healthy for us, actually, you know. But I think that laughter is one space of humaneness where you meet other people and they feel your humanities converge. It's very important. And you feel it inside. Absolutely. You connect inside. Yeah, absolutely. Stay with the African Leadership Dialogues. You raised the question of um, addressing inequity, inequality. You raised the question of corruption. Let's tackle those two things. Mm. Much of our inequity mm. is a result of corruption. Yes. As you've mentioned, we've been a rich continent and mm. if indeed we had focused on the benefit of the people yes. at large, we yes. shouldn't be where we are today. Yes. We've seen the Singapore's transform, even islands like the Bahamas, yes. that were in, deep in poverty. In yes. fact, Bahamas decades ago was a sewer. That's what they used to call it, a rat infested mm -hmm. sewer, totally transformed. Mm -hmm. But Africa, it, Africa remains in this challenge. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we've, we've lost the vision of the importance of collective development. We have forgotten that it's no good when we have an economy that shows, for instance, Kenya or Ghana or um, you know, South Africa are doing well, when it actually means that uh, it's the GPA that counts that will register 10% of the people who are very wealthy, who are making us look as if we are prosperous, but the majority are not. So that loss of sight of the collective and the need for collective development, not just a few rich people, you know, making the country look good, I think for me is, is, is a sad loss. And for, for me, it also pushes to another issue that um, um, we have lost a sense of true nationalism because true nationalism means the emergence of our country as all of us are pulling together to raise it. And it's not the work of just a few leaders or a few people. So let, let's come to that true nationalism. Um, Tanzania can say, you know, we've achieved a lot in terms of getting to a point where we understand what to be Tanzanian is. In many other African countries, there's the argument that we are a, a combination of many states rather than 
one nation mm. because our identities very often are tribal, they're ethnic or they're religious mm. or they're racial. Mm. How can our leaders change this? One of the things that um, Walim Julius Nyerere did for Tanzania, which is something we could all learn uh, out of, is that the issue of language is critical. Mm. And that language actually can unite a whole lot of people because language is not just the words and, and the exchange we have in order to communicate with human beings. Language is a carrier of culture, a carrier of values, a culture of a philosophy and a way of life and, and the way to approach it. And when you use a common language, it forces you to explore issues together you know, as you share in order to understand, you know, how they, um, you know, how they are emerging, how you can shape them up, how you can come up with new visions and so forth. Language is important because it also addresses the question of class. Um, you know, because if, if members of the um, intelligentsia um, or members of even the comprador class, the very wealthy, are speaking the same language with the workers and peasants and so on, there is conversation, there is dialogue. It took a long time for Kenya to adopt Kiswahili as an a official, national. a national How language. long? Many of us don't know. How long did I it? I don't remember, but really it was ridiculously long, more than 10 years. I could be wrong, but yeah. But Tanzania started right from the word go and understanding how important that was. And I think that that helped. The other thing that um, Tanzania did and Mozambique was doing is deliberately holding, you know, what you might, you want to call barazas or, you know, um, meetings in the villages, in towns and so forth, in order to mobilize people to think differently and hold debates on, you know, how they can make this happen. That conversation we didn't have. We should even have had it in schools and colleges and universities, especially in places like Kenya, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Well, they've done very well with languages, actually, um, where we had settler colonialism, because in fact, the divisions were worse in those countries than, say, West Africa, where they didn't experience colonial um, settlerism. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, so language, um, having the people hold debates and, and look for ways of, you know, uh, pushing this uh, further, acknowledging one another and actively debrainwashing us in order to remap our psyche, our psychology, our thinking, to see ourselves as a nation rather than, you know, entities. Actively debrainwashing. And remapping. Remapping. Our thinking you know, and if necessary, you know, the actual physical borders, why not? After all, we... They were not our borders. They, were not, they, they were are not our... 1984, yes. Berlin. Why should we not have thought about that? So right now, um, Africa is looking at um, how to integrate, to trade more. There's the launch that's happening right now of what's being called the tripartite free trade area. 26 African countries, Comesa, East African community and SADC coming together. Um, a lot of people remain skeptical. Some of the questions that um, I hear people asking is, are we even one, you know, mm -hmm. African, what, what does that mean? What is that notion? Do, do you think to be African is something? Does it mean something as diverse as we might be? Oh, of course. Of course, absolutely it does. I'm, I'm a staunch uh, Pan-Africanist, but also the kind of Pan-Africanist who is also an internationalist, who knows that to be a Pan-Africanist is also to understand because we are in Pan-Africanism, trying to assert ourselves and to love ourselves and to say that despite colonial brainwashing that we are inferior and that we are not beautiful, we are stunning, we are stunningly beautiful, you know. Um, that is really very, very important for colonized people because we were taught to see ourselves as last, as needing to copy others in order to know or think we had made it. So that is very important. Going back to our indigenous knowledges, and, and digging up those gems that are 
in uh, some of these areas, and I think of my own area of interest, um, you know, orature, uh, the spoken tradition and the stories and the myths and the legends and proverbial talk and, and, and riddles and so on, all those, they, they, they made us children of two worlds, to quote um, a novel by Mugo Wagaderu, um, the, the child of the colonial classroom, but also in knowing our own heritage, it helped, you know, de-brainwash us in order to understand our own heritage. And so, so it's taking pride in our Africanness and Africanity. Yes, I believe there is something African, um, both in terms of space, geographically, mm -hmm. and um, of course, in terms of um, defining ourselves to have you know, um, that um, uh, Africanity and sense of our continent, a continent that has civilizations way back before BC, um, the Nile Valley civilization, which is a part of Africa, however people may want to divide Africa in terms of North and South, you know, is ours. Um, the beginnings, the origins of humanity, it really is something we should be proud of, not chauvinistic, you know, or boastful about, yeah. So yeah. There is some, the Africa, uh, to be African and being in Africa are uh, solid. It yeah. does mean something. You know, I met an, you, you mentioned the Nile civilizations. I met an Egyptian girl visiting Kenya some time ago and I asked her, do you see yourself as African or as Arab? She said, there's no doubt that I am Arab, but I am also African. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, coming to Kenya and when she landed in Kenya and connecting with Kenya, she said something has awoken in her soul. I thought that was incredibly powerful. That is profound because we have to embrace the various identities we are. You and I have many identities. You know, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm a teacher, I am a Kenyan, I'm a Kikuyu. I, uh, there are so many identities. So long as we embrace this uh, without being chauvinistic or stereotypical about one another, what she said is truly uh, profound. Thank you for that, Professor. Let's, let's move now to the African citizen. And the African leadership has a huge responsibility to this continent. So does the African citizen have some responsibility as well? If you believe this, what, what do you see this responsibility as? What you are saying um, really leads me uh, to, first of all, acknowledge, embrace ordinary African people and um, how not only they have survived incredible historical difficult moments, but also the sense in which they have continued to produce and to believe in um, uh, you know, the various motherlands, including uh, um, our continent, Mother Africa and so on, and to work for it and to labor for it and so on. I celebrate them because really, sometimes you look at it, if I were them, I would look at it and feel like I want to give up hope. So, but ordinary people, have also got to liberate themselves from seeing um, themselves as people who are led. And as if responsibility to make things happen in Africa belongs to the leaders. They should claim their responsibility and voice to insist on this happening. And I give keep giving wonderful examples of constitutions like the South African constitution, the Kenyan constitution, lovely documents on paper, but until the masses of the people, Kenyan people claim that document and really insist on you know, having it translated into action, including they themselves partaking in making it happen is very important. There is nothing more, more dangerous than resignation and sort of sitting back and feeling, you know, I can't give anything, I have nothing to say. It doesn't matter what I say, it matters. It really does. You know, there's so many people who are cynical and have, have given up hope and see everything as, yeah. as, as hopeless. They've resigned, yeah. is what they've done. Claim your responsibility yes. and make your voice heard. Find your space yeah. to make a change. I say no matter where you are, mm -hmm. there's something you can do. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so inspiring we could stay with you um we're coming towards the close before i ask you to give a personal message to the continent where do you see africa in 10 years i'm going to say 10 because i want that we want to see it in our lifetime yes or what do you think africa can fully transform in in the next decade or so do you think it will take longer 
Where do you see the tipping point for the mm -hmm. continent? It is possible. You know, Africa is a continent of surprises, really. And some of the best things that have happened in terms of affirmation of people's humanity, not just on the continent of Africa, but in the world, have come from Africa. And I'm not saying it in any chauvinistic way. Look, our people survived slavery and not only created spaces for themselves in you know, foreign countries, for instance, America and so on, and survived and so on. But also some of them learned the need to humanize not just themselves, but also other people. Um, you know, independence and the uh, experiment of independence and what we had gone through and that we were able to heal and move on. What happened in Rwanda? And the fact that following that ugly historical incident of genocide, we're able to heal and move on, apartheid, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and so So I really think that, especially in terms of spiritual wealth and in affirming people's humanities, ours, and that of others, because of forgiveness and learning that if we are going to humanize ourselves, we have to humanize others. And so I think that has been an example that Africa is going to teach the world years to come. 10 years from now, you may be surprised. You really may be surprised. I don't know about this mother continent. It depends on how hard we work to make it happen. And I hope the kind of dialogue you are having here will take place continentally and let us inspire ourselves and tell ourselves we can do it. Yeah. We must do the work to make it happen. You know, Professor, I see a light in your soul that's shining bright in your eyes. And I hope you've got that light. You've got a bit of that light in you from this interview. Please look into the camera and deliver a personal message to the continent. The continent of Africa this is a continent with so much wealth, natural resources and human resources. And I know we can make it happen. We can make economic distribution possible um, among all the people. But let me just say in, word, word, in one word, I love Africa. I'm proud to be African, not in any chauvinistic way, but I think it's the best place in the world to be in. Yeah. There you have it. And even as Africans are striving to leave the continent, we must make it a place where they can find a living and where they can sit back and say, like Professor, that they too are proud of being Africans. Thank you so much for sharing Thank your you time so with us. It's much. been an absolute it pleasure. It went so quickly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with the African Leadership Dialogues. I feel completely inspired. What an incredible perspective she has and such a light in her eyes. I hope you feel inspired too. Let's get your views on the issues. This week we asked you, how can we combat corruption in Africa? Al Harazi at Clinton Spell says, voting in the right leaders, improving educational system and obeying the laws and regulations. Hi, my name is Brian Masiza. I'm watching Africa Leadership Dialogue from Kitale. Uh, Africa can combat corruption through the following. Reporting any sort of corruption case uh, to the appropriate authority. Educating the public on their rights and how they should uh, live with one another without any form of intimidation from anyone. Uh, obey the law and encouraging others around you to do the same. Thank you. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. Time now for Africa's Top 10. This week on Africa's Top 10, we feature the least corrupt African countries. The aim of the research was to determine how corrupt the public sector of a given country is perceived to be. Ranked on a scale of zero, meaning highly corrupt, to 100, meaning least corrupt. This is according to Transparency International. Starting us off at number 10 is Senegal with a score of 43 and is ranked 69th globally. Coming in at number 9 is South Africa with a score of 44, is ranked 67th globally. 
At number 8 is Ghana which attained a score of 48 and is ranked at position 61 globally. Taking the number 7 spot is Rwanda. The land of a thousand hills is ranked 55th globally with a score of 49. Positioned at number 6 is Namibia. The Southern African country attained a score of 49.3 and is ranked 53rd globally. At number 5 is Lesotho. The landlocked kingdom is ranked at position 51 globally with a score of 49.6. Slotted in at number 4 is Mauritius. The volcanic island nation attained a score of 54 and is ranked 47th globally. Seashells takes the number 3 slot with a score of 55 and is ranked 43rd globally. Coming in at number 2 is Cap Verde. The Republic attained a score of 57 and is ranked at position 42 globally. And at number 1 this week is Botswana, ranked at position 31 globally with a score of 63. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. And we close with our African proverb. This week it goes, By going and coming, a bird weaves its nest. Blessings to you and blessings to 